All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Jen Shonger from the New Jersey Autism Center of Excellence, the NJACE, which is funded in part by the New Jersey Governor's Council and the New Jersey Department of Health. I'm happy to be back today with Dr. Priya Lalvani, and she will be talking about rethinking normalcy and disrupting ableism in schools. Um, so I wanted to start out saying that uh, we actually have a bit of news that we can now offer certificates of attendance for our webinars. Um, we are going to link to the request form in the chat uh, before the end of tonight's webinar, and you can um, submit for this, whether it's for a live webinar or pre-recorded. Um, and with that said, this recording will be available anytime after it airs. You can share it with whoever uh, you think may find it helpful, and we will have Spanish and English captions. Um, so then my next thing to get to is that tonight, especially since this is geared toward educators and schools, um, I'm sure there's many families watching, we would love to know more about you. Um, whether you would like to share the school district that you are in, um, we'd love to give you a shout out. Um, and tonight is gonna be a bit interactive. We'll have a couple of polls. Um, Priya is going to pose some questions to us um, and uh, you'll want to be able to respond in the chat. So just make sure that you're logged into your YouTube account. So with that said, I would love to welcome back Dr. Priya Lovani, who is a professor of disability studies at Montclair State University. She's the coordinator for the graduate programs in inclusive education. She holds a PhD in developmental psychology and her research is focused on examining the socio-political context which frame the lived experiences of individuals with disabilities and their families. Her work examines ableism in schools and society and problematizes the segregation of many students with disabilities in schools. She's also the co-author of the book, Undoing Ableism, Teaching About Disability in K-12 Classrooms, and the editor of Constructing the Mother, Narratives of Disability, Motherhood, and the Politics of Normal. Um, welcome back, Priya. I'm so glad that you're here, and I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Jen. I'm excited to be back and um, particularly excited about today's topic. It's a topic that's dear to me. Um, a lot of my work, as you just said, is about um, preparing teachers to recognize um, ableism in schools. And unfortunately, we live in a society where <laughs> that is um, needed. Um, but beyond that, um, my work is around preparing teachers to prepare their students to recognize ableism, um, to understand disability, um, and to position themselves as agents of change. So um, I'm really happy to present here today. So I will jump right into it because I have um, a lot of things that I would, I'm ready to share. So let me just share my screen. Um, okay, and can you, can you see that? Okay. Yep. Let me put it in. Okay, there we go. So, oops, sorry. Um, oops, my goodness. That's not good. Let me start from the beginning. Okay, there we are. So today's topic is rethinking normalcy and disrupting ableism in schools. Um, and the aims of today's webinar, just um, to put it all out there, we're gonna uh, do these things. We're gonna question the silences around the topic of disability in schools. Uh, we're gonna explore why is it necessary even to talk about disability? I mean, I get that question a lot. Like, why should we talk about disability with children? I mean, isn't, isn't that something that will just upset them? Um, we're going to learn to recognize ableism in the context of schooling um, and also learn some practical strategies for introducing disability within K-12 curricula and consider ways to invite children to really rethink these assumptions about what is, what is normal um, and to start to understand disability as a natural um, and even valued form of human diversity and human variation, because we don't really think about disability in that way. So 
we'll start with a little bit of a, a poll. Um, you should see something popping up in your chat. So it's a simple question, I guess. Um, do you think that the topic of disability should be taught within school curricula? Um, and just to make sure we all understand, um, I'm not asking whether children with disabilities should be taught the general education curriculum. I'm asking, um, should the topic of disability be a subject of inquiry within the general education curriculum? So if you, you know, wanna take a moment to just respond to that poll. So far, we have 100%. OK, great. I out of 44 people. Fantastic. So let's look at um, why we even need to be talking about this. So why should disability be something we look at in schools? Um, so first of all, people with disabilities represent a historically marginalized group, actually. Um, people with disabilities are the largest minority group in the United States. Um, in recent decades, there has been the emergence of the disability rights movement. Um, not a lot of people are aware of it, even of its existence. Um, the disability rights movement is aimed at challenging the oppression of people with disabilities and creating um, greater access and inclusivity in society. But despite all of these things, um, and events, the collective history, and I say collective history because people with disabilities have a collective history. That is a history of oppression. That is a history of marginalization. Um, it, it's also a history of empowerment, by the way. We shouldn't just position it as a history of oppression. It's also one in which people with disabilities have empowered themselves, created a, a rights movement. But despite all of this, that history remains largely outside the public awareness. Um, American history books do not typically, uh, or to my knowledge, until recently even at all, it is not mentioned in um, our high school curriculum or any at all. Um, and overall, there is little discussion, if any, about disability, the disability rights movement, disability culture, disability pride, None of it is talked about in schools. So here we have another poll question and we'll take another few seconds. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, was disability or disability history taught to you as part of your curriculum or openly discussed by teachers when you were a student? Polls just coming up now. While we're waiting, um, I'll say we have people here from East Windsor. Um, Arcadia University, uh, Fishers, Indiana, Davis, California, Missouri, uh, University of Missouri, sorry, Vancouver, Canada, Early Head Start in Newark, Norway, a lot of, a lot of different places here. Wow. Um, <laughs> all right, so. So far, we have 90% say no, disability was not taught in the curriculum. That's, um, th I'm, and I'm not surprised. And as a teacher educator, I ask almost in every class that I teach, I have asked all of the teachers that I've worked with and the vast majority of them, you know, the vast majority say that they have 
were not taught. And moreover, what is disability history even? So that's just something that um, that's interesting to me because there is no other group that it would be okay to put teachers before if they were not aware of that group's collective history. I mean, we would think it were preposterous mm -hmm. um, to have no idea that that, that that group even has a history. Um, but yet in the context of disability, we have a system in which we prepare teachers to work with children with disabilities and their families um, without an understanding of where this group has been. So that's, um, I'm trying to go to my next slide. There it is. All right. So let's look at the elephant in the room and uh, have a little bit of humor there on the right. But um, so today, there is a growing recognition um, among social justice educators about the need for anti-bias curriculum. That's something that within social justice education is very much the push. Um, the need to buy, by anti-bias curricula, I mean anti-racist, anti-sexist, like teaching children about oppression. Um, I know there's also a big pushback. I mean, if you look at what's happening in some of the states right now, um, but I'm talking about within social justice education, there's a growing recognition of the need to teach children um, to recognize and disrupt bias. But what's interesting is even within that, even within that framework, even within the context of social justice-based education, you will find that disability is often missing, right? Um, and um, David Connor, who is a disability um, studies scholar, likes to, uh, not likes to say, but says, um, it's almost as if disability is the uninvited guest at the social justice table. So um, that's really something that we need to think about because within conversations on oppression, when we are not talking about disability oppression or we have no awareness of the idea that that exists, that in itself is a problem. Uh, and so what does happen is that there's generally a silence around the topic of disability in schools. We don't talk about it, you know, don't ask, don't tell. Um, so again, why is it necessary? People with disabilities have a collective history. People with disabilities have made and continue to make significant contributions on our members of our society. Not only that, but are members of a vibrant disability culture. Again, two words that don't feature side by side very often, disability and culture, right? Um, so when we don't talk about it and we don't address it and it's left unmentioned, it sends a loud message because let's not forget that not saying something is saying something, right? The silences are loud and clear. The silence around disability sends a message that the topic is not relevant to those without disabilities. It remains in the purview of special education. I don't know how many times I've been told as a professional, oh, you're talking about special ed. Oh, okay, got it. We're talking about diversity. We're talking about social justice. You're talking about kids with disabilities. Oh, so, so you, you mean special education. I'm like guided into that area, right? Um, the message it sends is that it's not relevant outside of the world of special educators for some reason. Um, not only that, but people with disabilities become invisible. Um, and I have to sort of, I have to say and question if social justice education aims to confront oppression, then not including the topic of ableism, and I'm gonna talk about ableism in a minute and what it is for those who are not familiar, but not including the topic of ableism in social justice education is in itself a form of oppression. So the silences perpetuate the stigmas and shame around disability. When we're not talking about it, it becomes a shameful thing. So let's look at some myths that we have about children and their understanding of disability and difference. Um, and many of you might have heard this idea or hold this idea 
Um, but many of the teachers I work with um, come with this belief that, um, you know, young children, they're, they're innocent. They're so, they're, they don't even notice. They are so kind. They, and they are, I'm not saying they're not, but this idea that young children do not notice disability or differences related to disability is a belief that many people hold, that we don't have to say anything. Um, a lot of times educators, um, and, and not just educators, but I should say people, um, this idea that not noticing disability is a good thing. Like if you're not a biased person, you don't even see it, right? Like, oh, I, I notice, you know, um, as if somehow that's a good thing. It's a very similar, a lot of disability rights um, scholars have equated that to the idea of being colorblind, um, right? Um, this idea that we don't notice race. Like, oh, I don't even see color, right? This idea that we may have come across. Um, in, in, in that area of scholarship about race and racism, many scholars have equated not noticing race as a form of racism, right? Um, and colorblindness, the idea that we don't notice a person's race is very problematic. Um, on, we, that's a conversation for another day, right, Jen? Um, but, so not noticing disability is considered similarly somehow a good thing. And um, many teachers also genuinely, even, even when they do want to, or they, they, they wish to, but um, they've expressed that they feel concerned or fearful. Um, they don't know how to do it. They feel ill-equipped to do it. Uh, and I'm not sure if they should be doing it. So let's look at this myth about children and their not noticing differences, right? Um, contrary to popular belief, I would argue, as many that have done research in this area, that children are likely to notice differences related to disability. And actually, when you think about it, why would they not? That's the question. The question is not why would they notice? The question is why would a child, um, and children are curious. And that's what's great about children. They notice things around them. They have questions, they have curiosities. Um, what is happening when teachers say um, that children haven't even brought it up? Nobody asked, nobody ever asks me, says many teachers to me. What might have happened is that children may have internalized that certain differences are valued and they can be mentioned. But some things appear different, but we've learned to silence that curiosity. And we give children many messages about which differences are valued and which differences are not in society. And we give them messages by hushing them, right? Or Shh, don't look, don't stare, don't ask. Look, you know, and I, I shouldn't say just teachers, as parents, you know, I mean, we might have grown up, you know, think about your own, the ways in which the adults around us might have responded if we pointed out as a child a different, oh, you know, wh why is this? And we are told, shh, you know, keep walking, <laughs> right? So children pick up that there's something here that we're not supposed to say. And when children pick up that some things are not men meant to be mentioned, then the message is that that can't be a good thing, right? Because something that I'm not supposed to mention cannot be a good thing. So when we say we don't notice things, we're actually telling children that those things are not good things. So in fact, children with and without disabilities can and should be invited to learn about disability, disability issues, accessibility, what it means, what is disability culture, and be given honest answers to their question. Tell me that a child doesn't notice that a classmate is using an adaptive device or is communicating with a communication board or another one leaves the classroom with a speech therapist 
or somebody else is sitting with another adult next to them, right? Why would they not have questions, genuine questions about those things? So what is happening is that ableism is at play here, um, is at the root of this omission or this absence of open dialogue about disability in schools and society generally. So let's take a moment because some people might be familiar with the term ableism, um, some people may not be. Um, so ableism quite simply is the persistent devaluing of disability or viewpoints in which disability is understood as an inherently negative state of being. So in an ableist society, the privileges enjoyed by able-bodied people are upheld. And how are they upheld? And we're gonna look at that through this whole webinar in the context of schools, but they are upheld through our laws, through our policies, through the rules in schools, through the ways in which we've set schools up, how learning occurs or what we think is normal ways of learning, of moving, of communicating, so ableism also manifests as a lack of access, lack of opportunity um, and absence and omission about conversations about disability and um, in, in knowledge and culture. So I guess a simple and quick way of understanding it is it's like the other isms I like to say to people who ask me, what is this ableism you keep writing about, right? Um, so ableism is an analogous concept um, to racism, sexism, classism, and the other isms as they're called. Um, like all the other isms, it originates in fear or prejudice, but it unfolds as a system of oppression at three different levels. The individual level, it's your individual beliefs. Um, at the cultural level, it, is, it manifests in cultural norms and, and understandings about what is okay and what is not. And most damaging, like for any of the isms, is the institutional level. Because at that level, it manifests as policies, expectations, laws, and so forth. So I've said that it's like the other isms, right? But in one way, I argue, it is not like the other isms. This one is largely outside the public consciousness, which is why I'm defining it right now. And I do on a daily basis. Once a day, I define it to somebody, right? And I, I, when I was writing my book on doing ableism, so you can just imagine like every day, right? Some aunt or uncle or a friend or neighbor, like, what are you writing? I'm doing it. Like, what? what? Um, so it remains, uh, we, we still, it's just not, it hasn't made it as part of the public consciousness. Um, and some people argue that it remains a permissible prejudice. This one, is okay. It's okay to not know about it, to not address it in schools, to not talk about it. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you give me one second? I so apologize for that. Okay. I forget. You're fine. That. You're fine still own a landline <laughs> and nobody even knows that it's still there. Um, anyway, so let's look at this. So to all of those who wonder how or why or should we be talking about disability and ableism in schools, um, Here's something that we do need to know, particularly as educators, and this is sort of relatively new in the landscape of education. So in December 2018, and many people might already know this who are here on this uh, webinar, um, Governor Murphy signed into law um, that starting in the 2020 academic year, the um, contributions and histories of LGBTQ and people with disabilities needs to be included in textbooks and instructional materials in schools. So this is something new. Um, so this is the text of the law. I just sort of cut and pasted it in here. This is, this is important to understand, but um, literally from the text of the law, 
we educators shall include instructions on the political, economic, and social contributions of persons with disabilities and LGBTQ people in the appropriate place in the curriculum. And why is that important to understand? That's what we're going to be talking about, actually, for a lot of this webinar, is that they don't mean as an isolated, separate, check off the box, talked about disability awareness today. They don't mean address it once a year, right? Um, at Autism Awareness Month, but they mean infuse it within the curriculum in its appropriate spot as it emerges. Now, it's great <laughs> that they did this. I personally think that an opportunity was missed because here it says in middle and high school. I think it was an opportunity to simply all across my work is um, about infusing disability in K-12 curricula, as you know, I've already said, and we'll talk about that. So for all those who will wonder whether we should do it, it's, it's not a question anymore. We should be doing it. In fact, it's the law. At some point, we do need to cover these things. So let's, uh, this is not a poll. This is more of like a reflection um, and a question. So I'm curious, what does your school do with regard to introducing the topic of disability? Um, in other words, what kinds of activities are commonly done, if they are done at all? But um, I know that you know, many schools do Disability Awareness Day or Awareness Month, or sometimes it's Autism Awareness. Sometimes it's you know, di different disability, like Down Syndrome Day. And I'm just curious, you can put in the chat box if there's a particular activity or uh, something that's done to raise awareness about disability in general or a particular disability. So I'll just pause for one person. Well, Jenny Anderson says nothing. Mm. We'll wait and see if anyone else wants to respond. <laughs> um, Mary Claire mm. Kovacic says peer to peer program. Sarah Delson says nothing. Wow. Uh, it doesn't, they have fluffy awareness days where everyone wears a color. That's from Brie Latini. Oh yeah. And usually it's um, for autism, it, uh, it's, uh, it's blue, right? Yeah. Light it up with blue. Is there anything else? And, and think about autism awareness. Like what are some things that are done for autism awareness in anyone's school? Um, so Sarah Elena says, I work at a therapeutic school, so every student has a disability. However, from what I've seen, they don't do much. Crazy sock days, does that count? Um, <laughs> um, someone else said, I retract my nothing statement. They celebrate 321 World Down Syndrome Day and light it up blue, but two days mean nothing. Yeah, but the question is, what are they doing for Down Syndrome Day? And what are they doing other than light it up with blue, right? So these are, these are, these are informative, your comments. Yeah. And I think nothing is unfortunately a common, a common response that I've encountered. Let's look at some of the um, most common activities. Um, I've, done, I've done a couple of uh, bits of research on this specific topic. So um, the most common activities that schools do, if they do it at all, so the comments are well taken about not doing anything because that I think may be the most common awareness response, which is nothing. But these are the most common activities for autism awareness generally. And I think many will be familiar with the puzzle piece, right? Yeah, decorate. I'm, both my kids came home uh, stages of their lives when they were young with the puzzle piece that they were sent home to decorate. And then the school puts it up. We have the puzzle piece. Like, I don't understand to this day what a child is supposed to understand about autism and the experience by coloring a puzzle piece. Like I, that one I'm, I'm actually genuinely confounds puzzled. me. Puzzled? <laughs> yes, puzzle. Like I don't know, Jen. Do you do you know what one is supposed to learn about autism 
like as a child from that? No, but there is research that shows that it adds to the sigma. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. By actually suggesting that, you know, that there's a, there's a piece missing or, you know. Um, so bake sales as part of fundraisers are also very common, it's, uh, not very common, but when schools do it, there's um, sometimes like, oh, we're, we're collecting for, you know, the I, unnamed organization, <laughs> which I, I'll not <laughs> mention, um, but there's certain organizations that schools, you know, collect for. Again, for a child, actually that's problematic on many levels because when a child is told, and I remember my daughter coming home, my, and my daughter, I, and Jen, you didn't introduce me as also a mother of a child with a disability. Um, so um, I am also a mom. I have uh, a, a one son um, and my daughter has Down syndrome and they're both old now, not old, but older. Um, <laughs> But I remember my daughter coming home when she was in, I think, third grade. And she said, uh, Mom, I need $2 for tomorrow's bake sale. It's for the kids with autism. And I said, so let me understand. You need to buy, I need to buy brownie, the teacher said, tomorrow to, for, for the kids. They have autism. And I said, so let me understand why the kids with autism need, like, why? how does this affect? equate right like do they need money like why are you collecting money for autism do you even understand like what what this money is for or like why is, she's like they need it yes, it's very very damaging to mm -hmm. leave children with the idea that people with disabilities were raising money for them so it's very confusing i mean do they need money are they poor like what's happening <laughs> right so it's like a charity based model almost and then, of course, there's your blue T-shirts, light it up with blue or mismatched socks. Everyone wears mismatched socks for Down syndrome day. Again, they're nice efforts, but they don't teach a child anything about that particular disability. Um, sometimes there's a famous person that we read about, and that's another common activity. Um, again, just focusing on some hero that has overcome their, dis it's, it's all about overcoming disability. Like, look, they had a disability and wow, um, they are a hero. It doesn't allow children to see everyday people, just people. Um, mm -hmm. And then number five, which is actually, I should have put it um, on the top because it is the number one most common. If schools do awareness activities, they are the simulation activities. Um, if anyone is familiar or has ever done it or encountered it as a child or it's done in your schools, please share in the chat. But it's this idea that you put yourself in the shoes of the disabled. You go blindfold, walk around. Uh, you have to like, you know, cover your ears with earplugs or sometimes you put socks on your hands mm -hmm. and you have to, you're asked to button, you know, your, your coat or you zoom around in a wheelchair or something. So this whole idea, it's, they call disability simulations. And I will take a few minutes on that. The reason I'm gonna spend a minute on this is because this is the one effort um, that, that disabled activists have very much spoken out against, right? Um, so this is not my opinion but amplifying that many activists, many disability rights activists have spoken in, uh, out against disability simulations and they find it offensive um, because of many reasons. And here are just some of them. But for one, they, um, the, they, they only focus on an impairment as if the experience of disability is reduced to not being able to see or hear, walk, you know, like, that's not the experience no. of a person with a disability. Um, not only that, but by walking around with a blindfold, you're only inducing confusion and fear in that child, you know, like walking into walls and stumbling over things all day is not a good idea to have children learn what it, what it is like to live as a person with a disability. Um, so it's sort of, in fact, perpetuates pity-based discourses. Um, 
it creates a sense of helplessness and leaves children with the idea that disabled people live like that. Wow. <laughs> so it's, and so I like to joke that, wow, so schools actually take time out of their school day to teach ableism, right? <laughs> In a society where ableism is rampant, you took those kids aside and you said, let me teach you some more ableism, which they would already have had in the first place. Um, so not only that, they, they miss teachable moments. I mean, if we're talking about awareness, those awareness days miss any and every teachable moment to understand ableism and our role in it as a society. Um, and they don't allow children to understand that with the correct access tools, with the accommodations, this experience would be very different. So they don't focus on inclusivity or access or anything of any value. Um, they simply allow children to reduce disability to an impairment and not very well at that, right? So I think I've ranted enough about that. All right, but here are some other well-meaning approaches, um, not just in schools, but in communities as well. In many community organizations, um, there's this common idea of community service where non-disabled children sort of spend time with, like they visit or they go to another school um, or they sort of hang out with a child with a disability and they get community service hours. I kid you not, right? So that can be a whole discussion another day, but again, it, it sort of promotes this idea that you're sort of spending time with someone with a disability and you get community service hours. Mm -hmm. What about the kid with the disability who hung out with you and had to work equally hard to try to understand you, right? So it's, we, we just, we're not positioning them as equals. We're positioning one as the helper of the other that needs your time or your help or your friendship. Buddy days, special buddy days. Um, I know at Montclair State, we have... Um, I think special friends day uh, and, and all of these are well-intentioned, but um, we really have to rethink it. And the, and the heroes approach, I already said um, something about that, but the idea that um, children only hear about heroes with this, like you got your Helen Keller. Um, yeah, a few people said the one person they would hear about was Helen Keller. There you go, that's the go-to, right? Um, and not that there's anything wrong with, with learning about Helen Keller and all the wonderful things, but it, it's, it's the only thing. And so for children, it's just this hero that is somebody who did some amazing thing, but not your local you know, postmaster or the baker down the street or the lawyer or you know, a doc, you're like, your teacher, <laughs> your teacher. Yeah. It, it, these are people around you in your community. So let's look at how we should really be introducing disability in schools instead of these um, patronizing ways that don't really get us anywhere. Um, we might start looking at the materials that we're using. First of all, do they include and depict disability at all? Um, we wanna select materials. So I should say uh, a disclaimer right here because when we're, we're we're selecting materials as educators. There's a lot out there that you can choose from, but a lot of it is ableist in itself. Mm -hmm. So be a critical consumer. I like to say be a critical consumer of the products in our culture, because it's easy to just say, okay, I'm gonna throw in this book or we're gonna watch this film. Um, but you wanna select materials that have positive or at the very least neutral depictions and non-patronizing portrayals of people with disabilities. Um, we're gonna, we should be providing tools to evaluate those to children. So I, and this is a personal preference of mine, but I, I'm not a fan of, of banning stuff or not using stuff or saying, you know, 
even when something is problematic. But now, again, this is my personal preference. I prefer to invite children to examine those. If something is problematic, I'd rather they learned about why it was problematic in any way. So uh, I think it's important to give children the tools to understand what stereotypes are about disability and whether they exist in this particular product. And as much as we can, we want to also try to include authentic experiences. And that I, by that, I mean, you know, using memoirs that are, um, you know, authored by people with disabilities, teach about disability rights, disability culture, access, and connect it to ableism. So another thing to consider, and you can keep sort of putting it in the chat box as we, as we go forward. But where, if at all, I, I think some people already answered that, you know, they, they don't see it represented at all. But if you think it's, well, actually, let me say, we may think that there's no representation of disability in our school curriculum. But when you think about it, it's there. It's, it's there. It's Lenny in Of Mice and Men, which is always, <laughs> mostly, I should say, covered. Uh, read in high school. Mm -hmm. um, there's, th there are examples. I just threw out one, right? So just think about in children's literature, if there are characters with disabilities, who are they? Where are they? Um, and what kinds of ableist narratives are we getting from the literature, the language, and the images. I'll just keep talking and keep, you know, like keep the keep the chat going about this. And I'm keeping my eye on the time as well, Jen. Um, yeah. So I just wanna, I'm sorry. I said you're fine. Okay. We're good. So some common themes in in pop culture about disability that we want to be aware of. So when I say pop culture products, I mean, you know, films, TV, the TV shows, the sitcoms, the books, um, and all of that, the literature that we read. So these are some common themes, there are many, but these are uh, the, the most common ones. So we see disability as something to be prevented or fixed or cured, right? And as I'm talking, you can think about movies that you've seen mm -hmm. um, that will come to mind. Disability as divine justice or punishment. That's a very common theme. You know, someone did something bad, you know, they got punished. And um, I'll give you a children's example. Um, I don't know if people are aware, but the original Cinderella, the Grimm's original Cinderella ends with the line. I, and I, you know, a rough direct quote <laughs> uh, from what I remember, but something to the effect and so for their evil ways, the stepsisters had their eyes plucked out by doves and they lived the rest of their lives in blindness. Oh. We're not mincing words there. This is not an implicit message. This is an explicit message. There's, there's no deciphering. And so for their evil ways, they will now live as a blind person. Disability as divine justice. So think about how unconsciously, without our knowledge, these messages are internalized as a small child. Disability, mm -hmm. bad. I was punished. They punished, right? You got struck down by something, and now you can't walk. Um, so disability is tragedy, burden. Life is not worth living. It's a lot of movies about that. Million Dollar Baby. Me before you. Um, Even, um, sorry to interrupt you, but just to say that a lot of villains have some sort of disability. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And um, the redemption narrative. And by that, I mean um, the non disabled person befriended a disabled character and learned the error of their own ways and became a better person. Mm. Um, like Rain Man, if anyone has seen that, right? You got your Tom Cruise character, you know, he was a bit of an ass and excuse my French. And like the, the whole idea of the movie is, and so he 
like learned to become a better person. So, so being with a person with a disability somehow is like elevates you and makes you a better person. And then the, the biggest one is lack of representation <laughs> that all these negative representations exist, but the most damaging perhaps is the fact that they don't even exist in, in the vast majority of media and popular culture. They just, they're not there. Um, and, and Jen, there's, uh, there's your point, actually. Um, absolutely, right on. So um, when we look at children's literature, particularly, and also adult um, literature and films and movies, um, there's a bunch of research that has actually done an analysis of that and the disproportionate numbers of um, the, the villains or the bad guys being represented by you know, facial scars or bodily differences and deformities. Uh, and in children's books, you've got to let, I'll throw out an example of uh, you know, Captain Hook, if you will. Mm -hmm. You know, so you've got your scary guy with the, the you know, the, I mean, you know, an amputee, basically. Um, then you've got your overcoming disability, again, narrative. You've got, you know, your kid, he works hard, he works hard, and now he can. You know, um, Leo the Late Bloomer, a book I love, by the way. <laughs> and I know it's a beloved book for so many of us. I, I like it too. But rethink that, rethink that. You know, Leo, Leo was just like, he wasn't getting it. And then he just like, his parents just said, you'll get it, you'll get it, you try. And he just kept trying and he kept trying. And in the end, he did it. But no one's asking children like, would it be okay if Leo just was the way he was? Like, why, why does he have to become normal like everyone else? Like he has to become mm -hmm. in order to be worth something. Um, and then you have your objects of pity, angelic, childlike, innocent. You've got the bumbling fool, the laughable character, the speech impediment, you know, the Elmer Fudds and the, you know, all of those, the genius abilities, the objects of curiosity. I'm thinking of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. I mean, just think about what that does to children's understanding of what little people are in their minds, these strange creatures that live in the woods, right? Instead of, again, like I said, people in your community. Inspirational, that's a big one. Inspirational people in books. Um, and now let's look at the hidden curriculum because we're talking about K-12 curriculum. <laughs> but don't forget that children also learn a lot in school, not from the explicit stated curriculum, but what's called the hidden curriculum, the messages that we, that we give them. Um, and so there's three different, I, I sort of categorize it in three ways. So we give children messages about the normative body. What is the human body? Um, you know, an example of the, you know, the common preschool song, you know, 10 little fingers and 10 little toes. That's just what it is. Two little eyes and one little nose. That's what we are. We've got two hands, two feet. This is what it is to be human. Um, then you've got messages about normative ways of being or moving, right? You see that like quiet hands, quiet body, sit straight. Like that's how people apparently end you have to ask yourself, like, who made these rules? Why is rocking or moving? Like, why is that not? If it's, it's not hurting anyone, why do I have to sit a certain way? Who decided that learning only takes place in that way? And messages about normative communication. We use our voices to say what we want. We look people in the eyes. This is what we just do. Um, so at the root of that is something called able-bodied privilege, right? Um, and it's this idea that um, environments, lessons, assignments, rules, expectations, everything, they are, it's a setup. And the setup is to the advantage of neurotypical people. 
So some children do well with that because they may be in the majority. But for some people, those don't work. So we also need to start as educators looking to include um, counter narratives, right? So you've got dominant narratives, which are the sort of taken for granted ways of thinking about disability. But when you look at the memoirs or the writings or the stories, oral stories or written stories of people with disabilities and disabled activists, you start to see some very different themes emerge. You start to see a resistance to otherness. You start to see a reclaiming of language, um, a highlighting of the attitudinal and social barriers and physical barriers, I should say, and communication barriers. So when you look at the memoirs of people with disabilities, you don't see those themes that we just looked at. Uh, more often you see a highlighting of some of these things, a questioning about what is normal, uh, a highlighting of the barriers that they experienced, uh, a rejection of the stereotypes, drawing attention to lack of access or acceptance. Um, so in short, ableism is positioned as the primary problem, not the impairment, but ableism as the problem for a person with a disability. So as educators, we want to ask ourselves before we embark on teaching about disability or we using some materials or using a product. And again, by product, I simply mean, uh, you know, films, videos, children's books and so forth. We wanna ask ourselves like whose perspective is this from? Uh, what dominant narratives or assumptions about disability are, are in here? What can this, what potential does this have to teach us about the disabled experience? Um, what are the counter narratives? Are there counter narratives present here? Does this product promote or disrupt ableism? So these are some sort of bigger guiding questions you want to ask yourself. Um, so generally in sort of these token attempts at sort of checking off the disability box, you know, as many schools, if they do it, um, then it's like a one day thing or a one week thing or whatever. Um, we wanna look at how authentic, like leading children um, to really, to ask questions, inquiry-based questions, um, and that, that we can all explore together and find answers to, but they should be infused throughout our standards-based curriculum across all subjects. And I'm gonna give you examples in just a minute uh, because I know that the teachers I work with, the, the one thing they all ask me is, how do you mean all subjects, not math, surely? Um, and I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm going to show you that in just a minute um, because there are many opportunities within our existing curriculum. So you don't have to take time. Um, and for all, if there are administrators out there, I will say it won't take any additional time. We want to learn how to embed, just like we actually already do with other groups, right? Other, other sort of, we talk about multicultural awareness and multicultural education should not be an isolated day. Um, you just sort of, you infuse a multicultural education throughout your curriculum. So I just put a couple of, um, like here's one th a thematic unit um, on learning about disability rights and ableism. So um, as examples, social studies is actually the perfect place. Uh, we already, it is already part of the curriculum to learn about civil rights movements. Why not infuse right in there the disability rights movement? Children already have to learn how laws are passed. Why not as an example, follow how the Americans with Disabilities Act. Learn timeline, because we do learn timeline. Uh, math, while they're learning about that in math, they learned about the ADA in social studies. In math, they could um, look up ADA requirements for accessibility. Then they could use math concepts, investigate how accessible your own school is or anything you could interchange that with any, any public building, um, use math concepts, practice math concepts, count the accessible elevators, measure the width, see if it's compliant with ADA, 
um, go to the bathrooms, measure the sink, the soap dispenser, everything. There's actually guidelines for all of that. And children could have a really meaningful um, activity. And of course, there's numerous things you could do with that data. You could learn to plot the data, bar graph, pie chart, compare and contrast to classrooms, compare and contrast to schools, um, prepare an accessibility report, examine your playground or any facility. In science, you can be studying slopes and ramps, learning about access devices, technology that can be um, like assistive technology that can increase access for everyone at our school. You could really learn about, and sort of this is what I mean about positioning children as agents of change. Um, allowing them to ask like, how can we create a more accessible school? Like, is everyone included? What does that mean? What does inclusivity mean? What does it mean to be a community here? Who's not getting access to this playground? And why, um, you know, like we could have so much, so much creativity with designing these kinds of lessons. In language arts, you can read memoirs of activists. You could write a persuasive letter to the principal, to the mayor, to the township with your findings about the playground, about the post office, about the local library and what you found about its accessibility. So you're learning to write, you're learning letter writing skills, um, you're learning presentation skills, you're learning graph skills, and through all of those things that we're already teaching children, you can also infuse a heightened understanding of ableism, accessibility, and what it means to really belong. When all people belong, what does that look like? Um, and just some quick examples, more examples, because I just wanna like put out a lot of examples for those who are here that are teachers. Um, you know, teachers in preschools and, you know, kindergarten, we do community helpers. You can select books or invite guests. Sometimes we have guests, you know, guests from the community, community helpers, right? Be strategic about who we invite and make sure it represents all forms of diversity, including disability, um, field trips to buildings to check for accessibility. Have a technology fair where students can research and investigate mechanisms of access devices. You can create a model, a diorama of a fully accessible playground or classroom. Research, this is for older, some of the older grades. You can research employment rates of disabled Americans, compare and contrast with other countries or states, learn about disabled artists, explore their art, learn ASL science, Learn about ASL poetry, attend an ASL poetry slam, um, have a disability pride or neurodiversity awareness poster contest, create a video, write a script, take on a particular topical news issue about disability. So these are just some ideas. And here I've just put some of my fave books. Um, they're all really great for all different um, and I'll give a shout out to my favorite book of all time. And it's Why Johnny Doesn't Flap. It's truly the only book I've ever seen that's written from a perspective that flips the narrative. So usually you've got your books about acceptance, right? Where it's like, well, it's okay to be friends with everyone. Some children are blah, blah, blah. But this one is from the perspective of the child with autism. And he's trying to be accepting of his neurotypical friend. And he's trying really hard. It's really sweet. So he's wondering why Johnny, his friend, who's neurotypical, doesn't flap. And like, what? what's up with this kid? And, but, it, but every few pages he says, but that's okay. Like, it's really great. <laughs> he's just like, you know what? He, he just, he, he seems to like one day he plays with trains, the other day he wants to play with something else, but you know what, that's okay. We can, we can accept him. So that's, that's a really interesting one to me. Um, all right, I put that in there because if you like these ideas as a chock full book filled with them, um, Undoing Ableism, um, which I wrote with um, Susan Baglieri. Um, and it's, it's really a teacher's guide. It walks you through how, what, where, and all of that for 
for teaching disability at every level, beginning at preschool. So just some considerations before you begin the work. We, we need to sit with our own discomfort. We all have to do that first. Like examine what is our own level of comfort or discomfort about these conversations. Reflect on our own internalized beliefs about disability first before we begin this work. And then consider what are your next steps? Like who are the people who will be allies for you as you collaborate in this endeavor? Who are the school leaders that will support you? Identify that. What kinds of supports are you going to need to get started? And um, yeah, I'm gonna end with two quotes that I really love. One from Mara Sivan Shavin and one from the Lorax. Very nice. Um, to everyone watching, um, we'll get to your questions now. So I'm gonna to try to go through and answer whatever we can. Um, I did take note of a few, but if you have questions now, please feel free to post them. Um, I just wanted to say one thing in terms of why Johnny doesn't flap um, and the fact that it it is one of the few that actually takes the perspective, you know, of, of the uh, autistic person in this case. Um, <clears throat> recently in a diversity, equity, and inclusion module that I'm taking, which again, as, as the theme of this is that disability is still a tiny sliver in that course, but there was a really great TED talk that we watched and um, the name of it was called The Danger of a Single Story. And we can link to it in the chat here, but I thought it was so powerful to watch because it, we all have bias based on our, our own experiences and what we're exposed to. And part of what she was saying was the importance of seeing stories like yours, because she had grown up never being exposed to stories that were written by, uh, they were all written by like white European guys. And that was like what she thought stories were. And so when she started writing, that's the kind of stories that she was writing. And it wasn't until later that she realized that she could write her own stories. And, and like that concept of representation is so huge. And like kids with disabilities don't get that and neither do their peers and neither do, you know, anyone else really. Like it, it's so lacking everywhere we look. Yeah, I, 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 that cannot be overstated. I think you're right, Jen. Um, can you imagine what that does to the self-concept of a child when they never see themselves in their favorite, you know, in, in books, in films, they just, they never see themselves. And I, I, I've seen that TED talk too, and I can relate to it very much. I actually grew up in Mumbai, India, and I was an avid reader. I loved to read. I had all these books, but all the books were the books, you know, like I read Nancy Drew and, you know, before that it was, you know, fun with Dick and Jane. And in a country where, you know, like none of this was familiar to us, but these were our favorite people. Yeah. You know, we, you know, we didn't know what snow was and, you know, this, this house of Dick and Jane with the, with the white picket fence and the mom and the dad and Rover on the, on the yard and they were all white and they all looked beautiful. And we just assumed that good children, beautiful children, they looked like this. I didn't see myself either. And I, I understand that, you know, you just don't see yourself and you internalize where your place is in that hierarchy of what is considered desirable and beautiful. And um, so for children with disabilities, that's even more so like they just, you, you never see yourself represented anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm going to, okay. So let me get to a question and then um, we can continue chatting about this. Okay. So from Tracy Kenyon Malarski, Dr. Lavani, what advice do you have for those of us working with teachers who want to know how they should talk to their students about disability? And uh, thanks, Tracy. Do you mean um, you, the children in a gen ed class? Oh, 
Oh, wait. Let me see if she responds. Um, while we're waiting for Tracy's response, um, from Alexander Wing, are there studies or anecdotal work on fostering disability culture in schools or programs which serve diverse learners specifically? Mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of there's a lot of literature out there on that. It's it's not uh, specific to my work. I mean, I I haven't written about that specifically, but there is a lot of stuff on that. You will be able to find it. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of people who are talking about how to introduce these ideas in schools, and there's research actually on the benefits of that and the outcomes of that. So you you would be able to find that. And so from what I've read about, there are studies which demonstrate that opening these kinds of conversations in schools um, actually leads to sort of really positive outcomes for all children, like, um, for example, higher uh, children score higher in their rates of empathy or their problem solving. Um, and like, there's a lot of really great benefits that have been documented in research as an outcome of doing this, opening these kinds of conversations in schools. Okay. Um, Tracy did follow up. So her original question was, what advice do you have for those of us working with teachers who want to know how they should talk to their students about disability? And she said, it's generally the gen ed teachers who are asking the questions. Um, teachers are who are presuming an able, enabled student audience. Yeah, so, you know, I, and I, I get this a lot from the teachers that I work with as well. And there's so many teachers who genuinely do want to do this, right? And they're like, what, what advice? I think I get your question. You know, I will say the, the first thing you should say to yourself is, it's okay for me to not know the answer, right? You want to introduce these ideas to children and know that I don't know the answer. But so I always advise teachers, take an inquiry-based stance. And I've done this work in schools with children. And so when I go in there, and I've worked with teachers as well, we invite children to ask the questions. And that's what undoing ableism is about. It's not about answering children's questions. It's not like, okay, I'm going to be doing this now. So like, how do I do this, right? Mm -hmm. So I would say take an inquiry-based stance, which means you would introduce a topic to children and say, you know, we're going to talk about disability culture today. You're like, what, what is that? Um, what questions do we have about it? Can disability be a culture, right? Uh, what does culture mean? So invite questions, invite questions, and know that we may not know the answers, but invite your class to collaboratively seek those kinds, like who can we ask? What can we look up? What should we watch? Mm -hmm. Right? Who can we invite in to speak to us about this and sort of create this collaborative inquiry with your children um, and sort of dispel this idea that we're supposed to actually know. Yeah. It. And one thing that you and I have talked about a lot now, and maybe this is like another useful like thought experiment is like when you don't know about a culture, like who do you generally look to, to learn about that culture? Like you don't, if you're, if you want to learn about Chinese culture, you probably shouldn't go to like, you know, a group led by like a bunch of white guys or, you know, like even parents, like with, when it comes to disability, like you said this in your last webinar, we shouldn't be even centering the parent perspectives in that sense. It should be the perspectives of the community that you're seeking to learn about. So um, like even for people who are just starting out, like you could probably ask yourself some of those questions and, and at least get to a better point because like the main point here really is that it does matter where you're getting the information from. Yes. And you'd be surprised. There is a lot out there, um, by disabled activists, by members of the disability community, um, you'd be surprised how much you'd be able to find. So I, I think you're right. I mean, we, we really should be looking 
for these answers from people who who are members of the community. Yeah, so, community. so kind of in relation to that, and then I'm gonna to get to your question, Alexander. Um, one thing we briefly talked about before was this, this tension of, so we're all kind of in this school system that is in need of a lot of help and repair when it comes to disability. So how, like, it must be uncomfortable to start realizing um, and learning about ableism and disability culture while at the same time, it's like, you know, these systems that we have that we were all just handed, you know, none of us had a say in, in designing these, but this is what we have. Um, you know, you could be talking about disability culture and then it's like, oh, there's the segregated class, you know, down the hall. Um, do you wanna say anything about that? <laughs> Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, it's, it's discombobulating, right? Because it's, there's a dissonance. There's a dissonance um, for teachers as well as for kids. We're giving them such mixed messages, mm -hmm. right? So there's the whole, you know, we are all equal message, and then we are all unique message, and we are all different, we are all the same. But there's this class, usually in the basement, but all right, somewhere that nobody is mentioning, right? Um, and nobody knows what to make of it. Mm -hmm. There just isn't, and it's interesting that you mentioned that. Um, I recently was reading about a school district that was doing a disability awareness day and and I'm not going to mention which school district, but um, there was much talked about and publicized as well, but they brought in a kid from some other school as a guest speaker. And the child um, had cerebral palsy and they brought him in as a guest speaker, which is okay, great. They brought in a guest speaker with a disability, a, a, a young boy. But I, I realized from speaking to some people that that same school had two self-contained classrooms at their own school and none of the kids from that, those classrooms were invited to Disability Awareness Day and the assembly where they actually had to import a kid from a different school and nobody asked. Like we're having Disability Awareness Day and we've brought a kid from a different school so that the, the, the non-disabled kids can meet, meet a child with a disability. And nobody asked, well, what about those kids that weren't invited to this very event? I mean, couldn't we have just met them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it just, not to mention. And so, and then that's like a, a multi-part problem there because not only were they excluded, so, was the like was the event accessible was you know like it clearly was not made it wasn't created with an inclusive no um you know plan whatsoever um yeah. but this was disability awareness event this was a yeah. yeah this was disability awareness day where the two classrooms filled with kids with disabilities were not invited and in order to allow the non-disabled children to see a disabled kid and hear from them, we, we brought one and we shipped one in. I don't even know. I don't know what to I don't really know what mm. to say about that. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, and, and what's interesting is that I was told that at the end of the, that, the, the visit and, you know, they heard this sweet kid who came to talk to them, you know, they were like, wow, this is so great. You know, they were all the same. Now there was the discourse of, see, we're all the same. There's, there's that narrative. At the end of it, it's always, see, we're all just alike. And nobody asked if we're all just alike, then why are those kids not with us? Yeah. And we have to be prepared to start fielding these kinds of questions from kids because kids do have those questions. Why are they there? Yeah. What's going on there? 
And kids do pick up so much from the adults in the building, clearly. Um, and it's not even, you know, not that I want to center other people here, but just putting this, you know, writer on this is that the kids with disabilities have siblings who attend the same schools mm -hmm. and, you know, their families are part of the community and, you know, have peers and, and like, so this is not just even like a singular, you know, person that's, that's being kind of othered in a way. If, if you're, if you're going to school and your sibling faces ableism, yeah. you know, you feel that too. And then you're kind of growing up feeling, you know, probably discomfort in a lot of ways. Sure. Um, and then even for the, you know, for the kid who is experiencing the ableism, you have a sibling who is not. Yeah. yeah. So like, oh, you're, you're I don't, right. like, I, I kind of, I'm glad that we're bringing this all out. I know that it is uncomfortable, but this has such an impact on people's well-being and it's kind of just swept under the rug. And one of the big things you pointed out last time was the socio-political context in which disability occurs. Um, and that there is a difference between the medical model of disability that we're all used to being exposed to. And then, you know, the social model, which is that, you know, the people and context and environment around you can disable you, mm -hmm. you know, because of their, their treatment or their lack of access, you know. Um, so, okay, that was my piece on that. Um, okay, I said I was going to get to Alexander. Yeah. And, and I'll just say that you you raise a really great point about like stigma and, and you're right, stigma is not just experienced by people with disabilities, but there's the familial experience of stigma people have written about. In fact, Goffman, who originally wrote about you know, stigma a lot, um, coined the term courtesy stigma, which is the stigma experienced by those close to a person with a disability, mm. who also experience stigma, feel stigmatized by, by being a sibling by that experience that they feel as well. Um, so that is, that's something to think about as well. Yeah. The well-being of all children. Yeah. And how many of the, of the books in our, if our, our classrooms, think about it for those who are educators, um, represent kids with disabilities. And I went to a classroom one time, I, I just asked a teacher, I've noticed that you know, there's no books about um, disability or disabled characters. And, you know, you have such a wonderful multicultural bookshelf here. I was just curious because she had obviously taken care to mm -hmm. pick wonderful books from, you know, around the world. And the answer confounded me. It was, um, oh, we don't have any disabled kids in this class. And I was like, but this book is called Suki's Kimono and you don't have any Japanese kids in this class either. Like, yeah. Why, why would you only include a book if you had a particular kid from that particular group yeah. in that class? So these are just some ingrained ways of yeah. thinking. And it takes a little bit of undoing, that's all. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a symptom of our... Yeah. And, um, and, people, and I have to say, listen, I work with teachers day in and day out. I think that teachers have their heart in the right place. Okay, I, I should say that. Shout out to teachers, by the way. Teachers, mm -hmm. generally, yeah. we've all internalized all, all of this. We've exactly. internalized it. It's, it's, it's me included, right? Yep. Um, and so I, I have to say that there's nobody who's going out there. Like, we just have to start to undo the societal medical model way of, of assuming this is the way it is. Yeah. Um, all right. So Alexander Wing says, how have the disparities you discuss and the disparagement of the idea of disability culture generally been intensified during COVID or have they? Honestly, I, I have to say, I, I don't know if I can do justice to that question. I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. All I can, I will say that, you know, during COVID times, I mean, um, did a number on inclusivity. I can say that 
for sure in schools. Yeah. There was a lot of discourse that I was hearing about, well, we don't need to be talking about inclusive education now. I mean, I literally got that so many times because because we're all at home, you know, um, which doesn't make sense. Um, we don't need to be talking about inclusive ed. None of us are included right now. No, that's not that's not true, first of all. And so um, it became like a, a, a quick way to, you know, that ableism was justified um, and children didn't have access to general education classrooms and schools, which were on Zoom at the time, which were virtual. Yeah. But inclusivity is not about being in a physical building. Inclusivity is about access to yeah. what, what is happening and in, in, in access to the curriculum in whatever modality. Um, but I think that the misconception that since we were not all in the physical space, we didn't really have to be concerned about access and inclusivity. Um, so yeah, I'm sorry, I, was it Alexander you said? Or, I, yeah. I don't know about um, how it has impacted the ways in disability culture is we may still need more time to really, you know, realize how much, how deeply things may have been. Uh, yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, I know there's been actually some to be, uh, yeah, to answer that question, actually, there's been a lot of talk um, and, and um, I've attended a lot of um, lectures by disabled activists who have talked about how the whole um, pandemic experience has brought to light to the non-disabled community the things that they have been talking about yeah anyway right um that it brought to light when when people needed access to you know uh technology and many people with disabilities have said you know these are the these are tools that we've been saying we wanted all along but now suddenly, when the non-disabled experience is disrupted, suddenly everyone's talking about, you know, access to a conference for everybody, you know, digitally, which is stuff that, um, that had not been really um, considered at any serious level in the past when disabled activists had been, you know, advocating yeah. for it. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to read a, a good comment from Judy Bailey. Um, she said, the dissonance reminds me of a line from George Orwell's Animal Farm, quote, all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others, unquote. The segregation is part of othering. That's, that's, that's it. That's um, all right, let me see what other questions we have here. Um, do we want to briefly discuss euphemisms like special needs and things mm -hmm. like that? Because those are very common as well and people mean well, but again, it's another one of those yeah. problems. Okay. Yeah. Uh, um, sure. Yeah. In the interest of time, don't do it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah. A lot of euphemisms used um, in society and also but particularly in schools, right? So you've got your, um, we don't want to say the D word. We, we use special, we use special needs, we use um, differently abled, um, all terms, handicapable, and um, yeah, all of these actually are terms that um, are not favored in, uh, you know, by, by disabled activists, to my understanding. Um, and they are considered euphemisms, as you call them. They're really, you know, um, disability. By not saying the word disabled, we are further stigmatizing it. Um, and as I said before, many in the disability community consider it part of, you know, part of their cultural identity. So in fact, um, you know, disabled with a capital D, as you know, disabled culture, um, very similar to deaf culture, deaf with a capital D. Um, and so we really need to start looking at what these euphemisms are really for the comfort of well-meaning, as you said, um, professionals or just people um, 
who think they're they're doing the right thing, but they actually just um, make this more problematic. Yeah, um, and there is there's a decent amount of research now about euphemisms and how much damage they can do. Um, we actually, if anyone is interested, we had a previous webinar with Morton Gernsbacher and she talks about that a lot in her research. Um, I wanted to go back to a question that Sarah Elena had asked earlier, which was about the disability simulation. And she wanted to know if there was a responsible way to do this and said, I want to simulate sensory overwhelm for staff, though to show how our students with sensory processing issues are experiencing uncomfortable or distracting situations. So what do you think about that? Um, I mean, again, my answer is not the be all, but I, I would advise staying away from it. And again, I mean, it's not what I think, uh, like you said earlier, like I'm taking my cues from what uh, I'm, I'm, I'm turning to people with disabilities mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm trying to, to learn to be an ally through what I learn. Um, and so I don't, I, I don't know if there's any, there's ever a good way to do a simulation. Can you like, can people talk about experiences that like we've all experienced? So like think of a time when you know, like I had an MRI recently, hopefully that's not TMI, but like, and it was awful. I mean, I was so dysregulated and, and in like a state of panic, basically. Yeah, but we run and the it, risk of, I don't know. I don't know the answer, right? I'll be honest. I, I, I feel like we run the risk of equating those things. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's better to, to, to read about or hear about or watch a video about somebody um, who's talking about the experience and what it feels like. But I, I think yeah. whenever we try to experience it in some way, we run the risk of not experiencing it. In yeah. the way. Um, and, and furthermore, but, but the other thing, and we just have so little time left, but I think that the issue is, even if you do simulate whatever that experience is, um, the issue is that the, the disabled experience may not be about the, the, the impairment. Right. It's about lack of access when you are experiencing that. Right. And how do you simulate that? I would say the only responsible way to do a simulation if one has to is try to simulate ableism. You know? Now but that would, would be yeah. good. That would be a good simulation to do. <laughs> like if you want to try to, I don't know, if you want to try to simulate somebody's experience, um, like try to experience what it feels like to experience that in the absence of being given, but the focus should be the absence of the access or the accommodation, not the experience, the, the sensory experience in itself, because that's not the whole of it, I think. Yeah. No, that's brilliant. Say that again. It's not about the the experience of the disability or impairment, it's about the experience of not having access or accommodations or accommodations. Yes. It's, it's not just the sensory experience. It's the sensory experience in the absence of the accommodations and access. And that should be the focus. Yes. That's brilliant. Um, okay. That's brilliant. Okay. Um, let's leave with this. Someone wanted to know if you lead any groups that have like educators or therapists. I don't know that you do, but let's ask that question. And also um, how can people find more resources about teaching about this or ableism? Obviously your book, highly recommend it. <laughs> It's outstanding. Um, the the I mean, book is so filled. many examples in here. Like it's it's just full of them. Um, and then, what what about schools who want to get more training about teaching about disability? Like um, from you. Yeah. What, you? what about it? I'm sorry. What's the question? So, do like do you provide trainings? And do you? I mean, I I have. 
I have, if that's the question. Um, okay. I mean, that's not my, my primary job, but I, I have gone into schools and provided training. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Was... So I guess, so the question was like, basically, how do people continue learning um, and going on this path aside from, you know, your book? I mean, there's was... a lot of resources out there. So I will say that. I mean, it was uh, it's generous that you pointed out the book. It's filled with examples about how you can go about this. But I will say um, there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, by disabled activists, um, you know, there's there's a lot of stuff you can you can look for that will guide you on non ableist language, on 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 this. We were talking about euphemisms. I mean, there's a lot of stuff on online, but look to see um, really center the voices of disabled activists when you're doing that. I think that's definitely important, and that's one way to further your learning. You know get to know, follow them on social media. There's so much out on social media. Look what's happening. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, there's just so many people that are writing about this. And so I think that would be my number one advice, you know, start to follow, get to know, amplify and learn from what's out there. Um, you know, there's a, there's a great book, um, how to be an, and I'm giving a shout out to, to <laughs> this book, um, How to Be an Ally. It just came out. It's, it's, on, it's in my Amazon cart by oh. Emily, um, Emily Ladau. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, um, and I haven't read it. It's in my cart, but I, I, I did attend um, one of her talks. And so, you know, I, like, that's just an example. Um, but those are some ways to start to familiarize ourselves with how we should we, we should sort of ground ourselves first in the knowledge before we go out to teach children about it. Yeah. Um, and Sarah had asked, are there organizations or speakers that provide in-services around this? I think this is kind of what you were saying, that there are a lot of disability advocates who do this sort of work. Um, you know, it's just a matter of going out and looking for them. I did put one resources resource in the chat earlier that um, it was from the Ed Wiley Neurodiversity Library, uh, and it's awesome. Um, it's about whole body understanding, and it really reframes things in a, in a positive, you know, way. Um, mm -hmm. And um, let me see. So, yeah, I mean, I think the key is just making sure that you're trying to listen to the disability community and not, um, yeah. you know, not the yeah. following agendas of, of people who are not yeah, you know, exactly. aligned with. Yeah, and know that, you know, you, you may not get it right at first and that's, that's okay. I mean, I, you know, I've been learning this for years and years. And yeah. It takes a while, um, but, you know, just keep questioning. I think that's the main thing. Just question how you know that or why you know that. Like, why is that the truth? Mm -hmm. like, how do we know that? Who said it was, this was the way it was? Um, I think once we start questioning things, that's half, that's half of the battle. Yeah. Instead of just taking it for granted, like this is how it's always done. Kids with disabilities learn best in these small separate places. Like everyone knows that. But once you start questioning that, how do we know? Who said that? Whose benefit is this really for? Who, who advantages the most from separate classrooms actually? Yeah, yeah. Then, then things start to open up. And, and I always say to my, the teachers I work with, don't underestimate kids, by the way. Invite them. Invite them to ask the questions and to together think of solutions. Like how can we make this classroom work for everyone? Can you imagine if we had friends of all different ways of communicating? Like what would have to change here? And I've done that activity with kids um, and you'd be surprised at things that I, I mean, I wouldn't have thought of them. <laughs> yeah. The that they think of, it's, it's really cool to invite them and position them as agents of change. And this is your community. And we're calling this our class, our community of belonging. But what does that mean? 
really, if everyone cannot access what we're doing here. Yeah, I love that. Well, this was amazing. You taught us all so much. We still could probably talk about this every day on and on and on. Um, but I'm really glad that we got to at least cover a lot of these main topics. And it's not just about what we're doing wrong, but it's also what can we do right? And how can we do better so that we actually value every person in our community? Um, so thank you so much for coming back and for all of your wisdom. Thank you to everyone for watching. I love how active the chat was. Um, you're all amazing. Please share this. Um, we're going to put the link for the certificate of attendance in the chat. It'll also be on our social media. Um, thank you again. Please share, please rewatch and keep pushing to rethink normalcy and disrupt ableism, as Priya says. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. It's always great talking to you and all, all of your very provocative thoughts as well. <laughs> Thank you. So I learned from that. As well. <laughs>